welcome to the Agritech session um, of Investopia. Um, as everybody here knows, um, agriculture and, and food and the technology that supports it is absolutely the bedrock of a thriving economy. And, and the bedrock of that economy is going to be a healthy population. What we're going to talk about today is actually a lot of the technology and the innovation that is underpinning that continuation and growth of a healthy population as the, our global numbers start increasing. You know, today, we cannot feed our growing population. Some nations waste almost as much as they consume. Tomorrow for food production is all about plants without soil, meat without animals, farming without people, and a technology-led system which delivers environmental regeneration, healthy food where it's most needed, and a data-led farming resource which is good for your business through carbon credits and carbon offset, good for the environment by sequestrating, absorbing that carbon, and good for the population by improving their health. So it's really good for the economy through security of food, provenance, and really high quality food production. Knowledge is king, of course. Food production is at the beginning of a new agricultural revolution where data, AI, machine-led learning, and automation, um, where automation lead, and it's a rapidly growing sector, and it's attractive for investment for many key reasons. Our speakers in this session today, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Sarah Calgut. Um, I do apologize for not being you within, we're in person today. Um, I am just along the road at the marina, um, but unfortunately I can't be in the room. Um, our absolutely fantastic two panelists today are Dr. Debsi Araba. He is with us uh, from Imperial College in London, and he's gonna give us a strategic perspective of the mission to increase prosperity and to increase human nutrition. Uh, we also have Antonio Zamaritano, um, he is uh, CEO of Abaco Group, and he's going to give us his view on the software solutions for precision agriculture and environmental sustainability. You had a, a circular economy mentioned um, in the per previous presentation in this room, um, and it's really interesting because it references the new waste, uh, the no waste solution of nature. This is how technology is going to you know, technology is going to get us this position. One of the key points that we're working towards within the food and farming sector is, is the use of data and AI and tech um, in reducing our waste and improving our quality and improving the regeneration of soil and of course giving that critical nutrition um, to our population. Now I'd like to put uh, the first question to the panel please. Um, I think we'll start with you Debsi if that's okay. Um, what are the most interesting tech to technological developments you are seeing in the agricultural sector at the moment? Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. I would say, um, well, just, just to put it in context, uh, global GDP is about 80 to $90 billion. Uh, the agri-food sector uh, is, what, 10% of that, so eight to $9 billion, so, the, or eight to $9 trillion, sorry. Um, now, that's a compelling value proposition. The most compelling ideas that, that get me excited uh, today would be the ideas around market-creating innovations. They're these innovations that tackle non-consumption. So they're not existing uh, traditional addressable markets, but markets that are on the cusp of coming into their own in terms of uh, a new wave of demand. So technologies around um, mechanization as a service, for example, um, extension as a service, uh, retail logistics as a service. Uh, we're seeing the growth of these new market-creating innovations uh, across, across the world, all the way from Latin America, South America, uh, across Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, I mean, less in North America and Europe, but I would say in the growth markets and the emerging markets, this, this is a growth uh, proposition. And for investors, um, this is something to keep an eye out on. Uh, the, other, the other thing uh, I'd like to talk about is innovations in the public sector, because governments are now... Uh, more sensitive to the role that the public sector plays in creating the enabling environment for private entrepreneurs to thrive. Um, last year in September, we had a Global Food Systems Summit, which brought the systems thinking to how the world now um, considers the food and agriculture sector. So it's not just about the siloed thinking of whether it's ag tech or mechanization or finance or logistics or access to markets. It's about how you create this ecosystem and interdependency. I really enjoyed the previous, um, the previous session on, on the circular economy, and I think it's a similar approach we're seeing around the world with this systems thinking. Um, so for the public sector, I'd say it's the adoption of system, uh, systems thinking uh, to pr uh, promoting 
uh, the growth of the agri-food sector. And for the, for the private sector, I would say it's the existence of market-creating innovations. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Antonio, was there anything you'd like to add to that question? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, let me say, I totally agree with what was said, because, uh, I mean, the key point in my view is to orchestrate an ecosystem in a different way. Why I'm saying that? Because uh, probably a single technology or better, um, I think uh, that it's impossible to find a single killer technology able to solve the problem. Because here, the problem is uh, uh, solve uh, a quite important challenge. And so if you think from the demographic point of view, uh, population is growing and our planet, no, or better, probably, our planet is shrinking because of uh, pollution, because of climate change, because of uh, erosion. So at the end of the story, we need really to uh, produce probably the double in the next uh, 24 years, 25 years, yeah. uh, reducing dramatically the uh, number or the usage of uh, any type of consumption, soil, water, uh, chemical, etc. So the idea is that digital or the digitalization could be probably uh, the first green revolution because we are not working with uh, uh, chemical again, we are not working with genetic, but we are working just with data. And analyzing data, uh, we are able to create, of course, a different ecosystem and a different uh, synergies between the different forces. Of course, this means that we need to have a systemic approach and not just the technology. We said in the previous panel, in fact, uh, uh, blockchain, yes, blockchain could be absolutely useful for tracing uh, food or tracing uh, our supply chain. But for instance, uh, machine learning, for instance, for detecting uh, possible disease of the plants, etc. So, I mean, we need to orchestrate different technologies with uh, a common in a in a in a in a in a common scheme, and this is for me if the real if the real challenge, and uh, to synthesize means that we need to have standards and integration. Thank you, um, thank you both. Brilliant start, really lovely. Mm -hmm. um, how of the technologies you talked about, of the initiatives that you just started outlining there, um, which ones do you feel are sort of in the lead at the moment in terms of the ability to transform food security in the value chain? Debsy, do you want to start? Uh, uh, sure, 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 Sarah. Um, I think biotechnology is going to revolutionize agriculture. Um, just uh, a few days ago, about a week or two ago, uh, in Cali, in Colombia, uh, my former organization, the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, SIAT, launched a Future Seeds um, gene bank uh, It was received a $17 million grant from the Bezos Earth Fund. Um, within that gene bank, we are going to preserve and also share uh, genetic resources, plant genetic resources from around the world. So I think it's about the codification of plant genetic resources, the full mapping of plant genomes, understanding all the expressions of crop uh, varieties, sharing that knowledge around the world, in enabling uh, producers and also seed, seed companies to multiply uh, relevant, resilient uh, crops. So crops that are adjusted and designed to be resilient to whatever uh, shocks and stresses, uh, in environmental shocks and stresses they encounter, be that you know, drought conditions, flood conditions, heat conditions, etc. cetera. Um, another exciting uh, biotechnology um, um, advancement is in uh, the sex selection uh, for poultry and uh, also livestock. So as you know, in the, in the dairy industry, for example, the first time, I mean, I, first, my first visit to a dairy farm was about 10 years ago, and I didn't realize that male calves were either, if they were born in a dairy farm, uh, they either ended up as veal or they were uh, killed uh, because they weren't useful. I mean, male, male calves don't, don't produce milk. So I don't think that's a controversial statement to make. Um, and also, you then have uh, the poultry industry where male chicks, the day-old chicks, they're destroyed. Uh, we have brilliant ideas uh, from entrepreneurs such as uh, Yehuda El Ram, who's in the room here, uh, with Exit, 
And his ideas are working on eliminating the need to terminate or to kill uh, male chicks. And so you will have a process where you, you produce exclusively female uh, Dale chicks. And that way, one, you're reducing the environmental footprint of the, of the poultry industry, but also re removing or maybe reducing the ethics around um, the consumption of eggs. Because if people don't realize it, your, your consumption of eggs is, is actually an ethical decision. And so some people you know, might feel very strongly against disposal of male, of male chicks. Um, and I think the, the adoption of biotechnology um, is less of a science challenge and more of a communications challenge. And I say this a lot to my friends you know, in private entrepreneurship. The science is sound, the science is solid. And so what we need to do is ensure that the communication of that science gets to the right advocates, gets to the right governments, the regulatory organizations, and also gets to the right entrepreneurs. And also, of course, eventually gets to the consumers. Because we need to understand, as Antonio mentioned, by 2050, we're going to have 10 billion people in the world. Yeah. 10 billion people in the world. And so we're going to ensure that we, we, we're producing healthy, safe, nutritious food uh, that the whole world can consume. It's not just about calories. In the previous green revolution that we had in Asia, Latin America, the focus was almost exclusively on calories. And so you saw a push for the staples in maize and wheat and rice. But now the focus is on nutrition and health. And so if we're trying to ensure that we nourish the world and everyone, the food that we consume doesn't harm us, but heals us. And so it's, it, it, then, it then behoves us uh, to adopt all the technologies, you know, uh, at our current disposal. And so, Ideas around biotechnology, I think, get me really excited because that's going to put us in a position to ensure that the agri-food sector can be globally competitive uh, and sustainable and poss possibly more equitable and fair uh, around the world. Over to you, Sarah. Actually, I'm going to pass that back to um, Antonio. When we were speaking before we came on stage, actually, we were talking about sort of the, the ethics, but is there anything you wish to add? And I promise I'll ask you the next question first. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, I would like to take an example of another, of another um, let me say, how from the nutrition is it possible to orchestrate the ecosystem. We are working on a pilot project today in which uh, uh, the research center, I don't want to say the country because I mean it's something that silly is uh, under design, but uh, I mean we have a research center, we have the government, and we have the public sector involved. Yeah. So with the, with the research center and the government, we are designing a sort of, uh, uh, let's say, health soil scorecard. So a sort of, uh, let's say, sustainability approach uh, for the farmer. The farmer will be paid based on the scorecard or the respect or, or let me say, uh, the quantification of the scorecard. And the, the private sector is involved with uh, the large distribution because the large distribution may two things exactly in the, in the direction you say. First of all, make clear to the final consumer that the product is a product produced in a sustainability way and therefore uh, protecting the health. And second, is available to also recognize a premium price to the farmer uh, working uh, following the uh, soil health uh, checklist. Means that we will want to uh, create a sort of, um, of um, uh, let me say, a positive circle in which farmer is paid not only because of the grant, but is paid because it's part, a fundamental part of the ecosystem in which the ecosystem creates new value. And the new value is recognized by the large distribution who is available to pay an extra price for that. Right. So, and again, uh, I was say, as I was saying before, technology is the fundamental layer. Of course, is a fundamental layer in which you need to have a new business model because otherwise we can do the same thing in maybe with a more efficient way, but nothing will change in reality and in deep. Instead, to really uh, win the challenge that we have, we need also to completely change the paradigm. And this is an example of how we can change the paradigm. Excellent. Mm. Sarah, if I may, I wanted, I wanted to touch on you know, what, what Antonio mentioned and also what you asked uh, just before on the ethics of food. Uh, food is evolving. 
Uh, um, and I think, you know, we, we're on the cusp of what, what I would call food 3.0. Uh, there's a new uh, era or a new epoch uh, in, in what we call food and how we consume food, how it's produced, how it's transported, uh, how it's defined. Uh, we, as you mentioned in your opening statement, we have plants now that completely decoupled from the soil. Um, we have um, protein that isn't coming from animal-based animal, uh, animal -based sources. Uh, so we have these synthetics, uh, and there is, there is a new area of not just thinking, but potential business research in opening up new markets. Because we've had, traditionally, uh, large swathes of the world that historically do not consume protein from animal uh, sources, right? So what happens when these proteins are produced in labs? Are they still considered animal? Uh, are, they, are, they, are they still considered proteins from animals? And if they're not, then that is uh, you know, potentially two to three billion uh, uh, people, uh, a billion people market uh, for future producers and marketers of, of uh, future foods. And the other thing is food is, you know, we could talk about food as a cultural, uh, the cultural dimension of food, but ultimately food, food is about the chemical signals we get in our brains. And so once everything's digitized, uh, we, we are seeing, you know, moves towards patenting the, uh, the digital signatures, the electronic signatures in our brain that taste uh, produces. And once we have this, then ultimately, we don't need to uh, grow, you know, we don't, we don't sort of, it's, it's about, you know, I, I talk about hacking a cow or hacking a, 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 a chicken. You know, you don't need to rear a cow for a year or eight months or six months or whatever. As long as you can get the chemical signals that gives you that digital taste profile, then you know you are bypassing. Um, and, I su and I suppose this 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 scientific approach, you know, is in line with what mankind has done for millennia. As long as humankind has exist, uh, have existed on on this planet, we have always tried to hack what we eat. We started with selecting varieties from crops. Then we we started you know interbreeding, and then we moved to. Uh, biotechnology, which we are in now, but I think the future is full digital um, coding of food and taste. And so food 3.0 gets me excited, but I think you know, we're maybe 20 to 30 years away from this. Um, but it is something that I, I, I suppose future entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs uh, could be looking at and should be looking at. But I would say market creating innovations, looking at opening up ideas that open up new consumers uh, based on the ethics of what is, what is uh, permissible or not permissible for different cultural reasons uh, is also an exciting and interesting prospect. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Gosh. Um, Antonio, um, could you share some examples of the data management systems that are going to capture everything um, generated by the latest, techno latest technology? So we've been talking about um, better productivity. We've also been talking about sort of a greater contribution to that circular economy. And you know, food is worth such a large proportion. Was it 10% of global GDP? Um, uh, could you just talk a little bit about um, the systems that are going to analyze this? So can we really start drilling down into where you see the financial benefits going forward? Okay. Um, on financial benefit, let me say it's a tricky game because uh, uh, agriculture instead uh, has difference of manufacturing, for instance, in which you can replicate the environment. In uh, agriculture, except for, I mean, if you think about uh, vertical agriculture or hydroponic in which you have a controlled environment, but being in a natural environment is quite difficult to really have data as, for instance, for manufacturing. First of all, because you need to wait one year, mm. normally. And second, because every time the conditions are different, OK? And so you need to evaluate it here on a historical basis and see the trend instead of a single, a single photogram. But by the way, um, having said that, of course, the, uh, if you consider a full application of what we call today um, smart agriculture, or in any case, the, uh, yeah, well, let me say the smart agriculture, you have a tremendous benefit in terms of basically three things. One is water consumption, because of course today you can manage exactly the water you need uh, also differentiating uh, the machine uh, and so on. on the right side you can have more water in the left side you can have le less if of course uh, this is uh, what the requirement uh, of your crop uh, so water one uh, 
Uh, second one is, of course, uh, um, uh, time and productivity on your equipment, and of course, of course, fuel consumption, because you can optimize uh, the track um, path. Uh, and then, if you go further, you have a, a, a um, the, you can orchestrate the logistic process, of course, because you know exactly what you have, when you have, and so you can also optimize uh, waste in the logistic process. That probably is one of the most important benefits because, again, it's a benefit not related to the single application, but, again, is relating to the ecosystem. And when you have a benefit related to the ecosystem, you have a sort of multiplier because you can involve different sub-ecosystems on that. And so uh, you need to think, in my view, of what is happening in the uh, uh, agriculture today is close to what's happened 30 years ago in manufacturing, mm -hmm. when we start to have machine with uh, electronic control, then we started to have ERP system on system connecting data of the company, and then in between you added the uh, uh, MES uh, system connecting data and orchestrated the production today. It's exactly the same what's happened. We are in the middle of this revolution in which uh, company like my company, but I mean uh, there are a lot, in, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, doing this work, are, let's say, the middleware or the intelligence in between collecting data and able to provide data for the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, and why now it's happening today in the agriculture what uh, um, was probably 30 years ago in manufacturing because of two things. One is connection, and the other one is uh, uh, capability to see from satellite and image recognition technology. Because, of course, 30 years ago was absolutely uh, too expensive as impossible. Today, with the availability that we have of, uh, and the technology that we have around the image recognition, because we, from, from, from satellite today, or drones, we are able to understand uh, the crop health, uh, health. we are uh, un able to understand disease, we are able to understand pathologies, etc., etc. So, I mean, uh, with this technology, today uh, we are doing a process or evolution process that is very close to what's happened to manufacturing. And exactly in manufacturing, what's happened? The, the, the entire logistic chain was completely uh, reinvented, and I think that this is what will happen in the agriculture in the next three, five years. Consider, for I, instance, I, in the vertical or hydroponic, uh, or hydroponic uh, uh, agriculture, the entire supply chain is already transformed. Yep. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to start, uh, touch on, on people as well, because obviously yeah. people are really critical to this process entirely. So um, obviously ma manufacturing the last, you know, in 30 years yeah. um, have completely changed the number of people that they are employing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How fast do you see, I mean, obviously in the UK and in Europe, uh, my background is in two fruit crops, and of course we are incredibly dependent on some very skilled people. Um, how fast do you perceive um, that manual labour element being removed almost entirely from the food supply chain? Well, that's a, that's a tough one, Sarah. Mm -hmm. but, the, the hope is, the hope is, as, as um, the emerging markets industrialize, um, that the, the labor content of on-farm or on-farm labor shrinks. The on-farm labor numbers shrink. Why? Because you will be increasing uh, the value um, of, of the agri-food sector, but also creating roles and jobs higher up the value chain, you know, in logistics, manufacturing, in retail, exports, etc. Um, there's the future. The future of agriculture is not to have uh, tens of millions of hundreds of millions of people toiling away on farms. I think we have technologies now to improve competitiveness, productivity, etc. You know, Antonio has talked about a lot of these things. The information and decision sciences continues to grow, and it's also an emerging uh, investment proposition. Uh, we have Abaco, we have Grow Intelligence with Sarah Menka, who was uh, moderating the, the session just before us. Um, and the, the information and analytics improves decision-making, not just for uh, private investors, but also for governments. Take, for example, um, the, the challenges the countries have faced around the world as a result of the uh, logistics snafu, um, the second and third order effects coming out of the 
uh, lockdowns in 2020 uh, due to COVID. Um, a lot of people could have told you with foresight analysis, this could easily have been predicted. But what you couldn't predict is a ship container blocking the Suez Canal. Um, or, the, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the or the chances of all this happening at the same time. And then, you know, we also now have, you know, we're on the cusp of uh, possibly what is a, a global commodity super cycle. Uh, we also have high energy prices. You know, who could have predicted all these things happening at the same time? But when you have the information, when you have the analytics, if you were, say, an aggregator, you can um, better price your futures market, make better negotiations, you can uh, negotiate better prices in the, in, the, in the futures markets, you know, to ensure that you smoothen the volatility in price spikes. And then for governments at the macro level, governments should be able to collaborate with each other to work on something sort of a virtual uh, food reserve. So that you, know, you don't have this awkward situation, as Antonio mentioned, where some countries are producing in excess, and then in some countries it's famine. Like, no, there should be a way globally to smoothen um, uh, pr uh, supply, supply chain uh, issues. And it's with analytics, such as Abaco, that I think not just um, uh, the private sector, but also governments you know, can have that helicopter view of what's going on, have that macro level view, and then create that enabling environment you know, for a smoother, uh, smoother transition and less spikes and less volatility. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, we're very, very nearly out of time. Um, would you prefer to make closing statements or would you like to take a quick question from the floor? Your choice, because uh, you are actually in the room. You should be able to take some questions after the session, hopefully. How do you feel? From the floor, please. Yeah. Right. If we could just have one quick, concise question, please. Um, hello, thank you very much for the intervention. You mentioned the need for data and better data analytics for the future of obviously agriculture. And we know that that is the solution um, for, for the future. Uh, how, what would you tell governments in order for them to work together into sharing data linked to their different resources? Do you envision a global platform in that regard? Right, thank you very much. Now, data sovereignty is, is a critical issue in food, food and agriculture security, but I think governments need to um, arrive at a point where they can share at least some, whether it's you anonymize your information and you then you don't, you don't make it all, um, you know, create unique identifiers for whether personalized information and stuff. But yes, there's, it's important to improve the governance of data management, data collection, but countries need to share data. It's important yeah. because that's the first stage in allowing the private sector to collaborate. It's only when countries have a clear idea of whether it's demand or supply issues, uh, market, addressable market sizes, you know, purchasing power, et cetera, that we can do this truly collaborative thing. No country can grow and consume exclusively what it produces. You know? So everyone's going to do a bit of importing and exporting and we're going to collaborate. Whether you export uh, raw commodities and some other country processes, and you re-import some of those, but that's what the world has done for, for millennia. And so we just need to improve the trust in data systems, but also improve uh, the quality of data collection. Again, if you're going to share data, you need your colleagues or co-countries co or your colleague countries to trust uh, the information, the quality of the information. Whether it's governments producing the information and the private sector trust that, or private sector pr producing that information and governments trust that. We need to improve the trust, and we also need to improve collaboration. Antonio? Yes, thank you. Um, in a, very in a, quickly, Antonio, yeah, I'm One so minute, sorry, in, the, in the minute that we have. Just a second, because I think it's very important. Um, uh, the agriculture sector is probably the only one sector in which the government has the data in general, because the, uh, the agriculture is mainly financed by the EEC, by the government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Therefore, we have the data. So uh, instead, in the other productions, uh, in, uh, in the other productive service of, uh, sector, sorry, for instance, tourism, etc., we had the phenomenon you said. So maybe Google has more data than the government. In that case, it's the opposite. So the problem is just a cultural problem. We need to really share in an ecosystem the data that we have, uh, and using the data in a different way. And so uh, at farmer level, using, let me say, the transaction, at, at the governmental level, using what we say in terms of planning and orchestrating complex ecosystem. But we have the data. Mm. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you. thank you so much. Thank you for that excellent question. Mm. Thank you. Thank you.